Sí, esta la tarde. Approaching noches. I don't know what approaching is. Uh, I don't either. I'm not going to look it up. <laughs> I, You know what I was going to look up, though, is I need to look up how you translate beauty from Russian. That's what I need to look up. Now, I really need to get the, the background on why you need to look this up. Because... Because when you sent me a quote from Dostoevsky about beauty, I need to understand, is there some, is there some piece of the definition of beauty in, uh, in Russian that would have a broader definition than beauty in English? I like it. So what I do is I, I double translate. First, I translate beauty to Russian. And then I switch it, and then I switch it again, and I switch it again, and see if it keeps changing. So, like, the definitions that I'm getting as I, I reverse translate, I get loveliness, glory, goodliness, all kinds of things. Goodliness is relevant. Yeah. And I, I have an easier time. I have an easier time with those definitions of beauty than the English definition of beauty being the either the be all and end all or even just fundamental well so much of what we appreciate in terms of the definition of beauty is just the aesthetic final thing that we see and and that's what i was hoping exactly to aesthetics that's what i that's where i get stuck on and i'm like well not everything is aesthetic there's certainly plenty of things that are worthwhile and are ugly yeah well and then aesthetic tastes change over time too Exactly. And, you know, Campbell's soup can, um, can be translated to architecture. Um, some people are interested in building buildings that don't look like Gothic churches. Does anyone build a building without thinking about what it looks like? Yeah. Like chicken houses, um, you know, utilitarian buildings for sure. Yeah, I would I would say that's the minority of of architecture that most people interact with, unless you're a chicken farmer. Garages, barns. Although we used to build, I, I don't know. We attached, used to build proper attached barns. Or attached or detached garage? <laughs> no, I mean like shops to work on cars occupationally. So uh, you're so commercial an, garages. An industrial an industrial strip. Yeah. Well, can you think of an industrial building that's built with the intent to be beautiful? Yes, but I couldn't name it. And also, where's the line? Just because it's not built intended to be beautiful per se, there is still absolutely thought going into what's this going to look like, even if it ends up as an unattractive building. Like somebody has to think it through. What's this going to look like? So when you ha when you have I don't know why I'm going to pick on Charlotte, North Carolina for this, but I'm going to pick on Charlotte, North Carolina for this. <laughs> so as you, as you get outside of Charlotte, you get to the farmland and the farmland that has subdivisions plopped in the middle of it. And the subdivisions drive down what used to be a country road to strip malls. And those strip malls have grocery stores that have like weirdly Alpine vibes to the, to the facade. You know what I mean? Like it's got it's got surprisingly peaky roofs on your on your grocery store, which is not it's not really a, a structural thing. It's a how do we make this not look like a rectangle? And uh, so so then you end up with the thought that goes into that of let me slap a roof on that doesn't look like a rectangle. It's it's the thought is applied. The intention is, in, is to improve the aesthetics, but it's not it's not a beautiful building. <laughs> I mean, and that's that's what we were trying to wrestle down the other day. Does intent count? Have you been to Detroit lately? It's been probably three years. So you've been since they had the most spectacularly gothic parking garages in the whole country. I, I tend to stay away from downtown Detroit. Actually, like, I was just there last you gotta year. Go to downtown. Go to downtown. <laughs> gothic parking garages. It was it's gothic architecture that was then available. And got floors and floors of parking garages retrofit on the inside. 
cool. Yeah, and it's like it's like Pet, Petco Park in San Diego. This big old industrial building with this like six story high escalator, and uh, it like in front of it is just the the old facade. So the actual inside of the building is more or less completely redone, but it still looks like an old, uh, you know, factory building from the outside. Interesting thing about architecture. Um, a couple of years back, uh, I guess two years back, we went to visit my dad's family with my parents, with my mom and dad in, um, I'll say the Cleveland area near Cleveland. It's a very Amish community and the Amish are, uh, immigrants from my dad's family specifically. And that, that area specifically is are immigrants from Switzerland. Uh -huh. Um, like the German, I want to say the Alsace region, but it, you know, who knows, could be, could be something else, but they're immigrants from Switzerland. Anyway, I was blown away because I had just been to Switzerland the year before I was blown away by how much of the housing and all aspects of the architecture of that area looked just like Switzerland. Like they built into the side of the Hills, um, they were it, it, it very the, the architecture, even down to garages, farms, outbuildings, the houses themselves where they build it all very much looked like Swiss. I mean, how close was the geography to, to between the two places? Switzerland and Ohio. I mean, like is one of are you talking about Alpine region in, in Switzerland oh. versus versus Cuyahoga Valley in, in Ohio, or are we talking about like it's hillsides here, it's hillsides there. They both get, you know, snow in the winter and sun in the summer. And you know, yes. broadly speaking, it's similar yeah. geography. Yeah. That. So it's, so it's, so it's one thing if you take your, take your home architecture and your home culture, there you go. See that? And we're working on a segue. Take your culture with you from the Alps to Cleveland. <laughs> It's an entirely different thing if you take your culture with to you Dubai. from the Alps to yeah to Dubai or to or to West Texas or to even Los Angeles, right? Like the, there's a when you get to a place where it just doesn't translate. Like I, I I lived in an apartment that was on the seventh floor, and we looked down on this place, uh, physically looked down on, not not conceptually yeah. looked down on. Shamed it. You shamed and, it. And uh, palm trees right in the front yard. And uh, there are full grown palm trees that were planted, which is a, a significant undertaking. So to get a palm tree in the mid Atlantic is two to $3,000 for the tree, plus another couple grand for the install because it requires heavy equipment. These things can't be picked up by, well, they conceptually can be picked up by a person, but they are, they're managed and handled with heavy, equi heavy equipment. Uh, it's a, a four person crew. They have to come in a, in a dump truck. Like it's a big deal to install a single palm tree. And they had six or eight of them. I will also point out that palm trees don't take deep freezes well. Even one, not great for a palm tree. Just even one hard freeze is, is not going to be good for a palm tree. And so they died because it became winter. <laughs> and at that, <laughs> point, it does. at that point, after the trees died, one that got slightly sunny again, the palm trees were replaced with new palm trees. <laughs> yeah, I Wish I had that kind of cash to burn. I it just you know, and I think that the the indomitable spirit of trying to take a piece of your culture with you, I think there's something universal about that. You know, we might not all be literally planting palm, palm trees in the Mid Atlantic, but figuratively, aren't we all just some part of our life is planting palm trees in the Mid Atlantic? Yeah, if if or or a journey to try to figure out you know, what is the, what is the action that should be planting palm trees? You know, what is, that's a lot of what I find myself doing now. You know, I don't have very far to go because we know a lot about our, our lineage, but, um, you know, what is, what is my cultural background? I've, I've, I'm fascinated by people who know that I'm, I always want to hear it. Like what, you know, where did your ancestors come from? What was their story? Do you know? D do you think it's weird that a lot of people have no clue, like no, no. curi, like no curiosity though? Mm, I think shoved into their face, almost anyone would think about it. Number one, 
and like there's not anybody who would be hostile to it if it was made extremely obvious i mean i can't prove that but if, if somebody's if somebody has your like your lineage suddenly becomes you know this is this is the people that were your grandparents 400 years ago or if you're traveling to some random faraway place in the world and it turns out that that's where you know that's where your ancestral family was you're going to care about that so much more than if it was somebody else's ancestral family uh so i think everybody cares when it's right in front of them number one and number two i mean everybody who is who has emigrated to somewhere else cares a lot more because they have to carry it with them the people that are like if your culture is a subdivision in a, in a farm field that has vaguely alpine grocery store design to it and then you grow up and you move to a different subdivision or like go crazy and go from charlotte to phoenix you know like you, you're, you've left the south you've entered the desert you now have a different culture but i still think you know you'll you'll carry with you much more than if you are in this you know if you've moved a cornfield over or if you've moved two subdivisions away shoot even if you move from you know suburban detroit into downtown detroit you're gonna you're gonna take something about that suburbs with you and you're gonna associate with that more than you do with the the place where you end up yeah you know what i'll miss in our when? <laughs> miss like, when? you know what are i you miss going somewhere <laughs> you know what i miss currently we have, uh, you know, with you know, sort of the decentralization of music, we'll never get shy rock star again. You know, like that fake shy rock star vibe that they all did on the first record. You know, I think of Eddie Vedder for whatever reason. Okay, and, go on. And... <laughs> And it's, I mean, it's not just him. I don't mean to single him out, but I culturally, I don't think we'll ever get, you know, because they've been so thirsty for the spotlight. Tom York's another good example. You know, they're, they're so thirsty for the stop, the spotlight. You, you don't do that thing, which is try to get your band in front of a whole bunch of people. If you're not thirsty. Yeah. And then, you know, once the attention comes, you're like, you know, oh, shucks, you know, shy rock star guy. I hate it. I, I hate it that we'll never get that again. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, certainly you have enormous fragmentation compared to the time when when Radiohead or, or um, Pearl Jam rose to fame. So the there may be mega artists, but the number of sort of, you know, no offense to Pearl Jam, but they were always like nirvana's backseat driver yeah right like nirvana was bigger and you know radiohead is gigantically huge and, and has been for a long time but a lot of that's also with retrospect right so people that were you know really 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 into okay computer didn't necessarily hang around for three more albums after that so the you know it's not like we're talking about the rolling stones or the foo fighters also i really cannot get over the fact that the foo fighters just continue to sell colossal amounts of tickets to play i like i haven't i don't know a foo fighters song from the last 15 plus years <coughs> i don't either and to be honest um i think a lot of people say this about bands just because it's the cliche thing you know a lot of our people who are into music say this like their first record was good but i didn't like anything after that that's actually the case with me and foo fighters i i loved that first record the self-titled album or whatever. I don't even know what the, the title of it was. I don't think it had a name. I think it's self-titled. Yeah, just the gun on the front. Do you know why Reagan. you liked it? Because Dave Grohl wrote all the songs, played all the instruments, recorded it all while he was on tour with Nirvana. I mean, and, it, like, and it was raw. I mean, it was a, it was a garage album. And yeah. then everything after that became not garage albums. And that's not a value judgment. It's what they wanted to do. Um, but not 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 my thing. I, I bet you love Weezer so much. No, never did. <laughs> never did. There's a shy rock star. He, he was like, "This is too much. I can't believe my second album didn't go, didn't go platinum." <laughs> Screw you guys. I'm going to Harvard. Radiohead is is probably if there were an award for 
band that I actually really like that I wish I didn't, it would be Radiohead. I don't, you can make an award for that, but no oh. one else is going to make an award for that. No, I'm That's making that award. I'm making That's that award you. here. What's the I, best Radiohead album? Um, I'm partial to the bins. I respect OK Computer because obviously it ushered in, you know, our our technology world sonically. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great record. I mean, it's a great record. But I I liked Kid A and um, what was it, Amnesiac? After that, yeah, those two were right right one after another. I liked them both uh, both of those records a lot. And then the album after that was trash. And then uh, in Rainbows was pretty good. And then I don't know anything since then. <laughs> what about Tom York's solo stuff? Nah. Don't listen or don't don't know it. I, I mean I know some of it. Isn't is that Adams for Peace or does he play uh Adams for I, Peace was a was a super group with Flea and somebody from REM and somebody else I don't know. Mm. He's so he's released stuff in a couple bands, including Adams for Peace, but then also done a bunch of solo stuff and also been featured on a bunch of things by himself. Um that was ne- that didn't end up on any albums. It was just sort of like random compilation stuff or singles. He did do a song, um, and we're totally in the weeds now, but he did do a song with Fortet, and you know, I'm a huge Fortet fan. That, and, yeah, that checks out. Fortet is for Radiohead fans that fell off the Radiohead bandwagon when Radiohead got more electronic, and we're looking for something less popular than Radiohead. <laughs> yeah, and less whiny. Uh, but you can't whine when there's no lyrics. That's correct. That's the whole thing. Have you seen the Have you seen the releases that um, Fortet, the producer whose given name I think is Kieran Hebden, uh, he 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 just used indecipherable characters like Wingdings, and then it was like four thousand songs on a Spotify pay- playlist, and a bunch of them were just Wingdings characters that were pieces he had put together. But like they, they were not credited to him. like you can't credit it to him because it is random characters. Some of the music was okay. I, I I wish I could refer you more clearly to it, but since the names are unpronounceable and they aren't credited to an artist that's that's usable, I and mean, this is like the artist formerly known as Prince using the symbol as yeah. his name and then taking that like twenty levels further. I did see uh, uh, a thing a thing a youtube um video of fortet at some cabin in the woods just doing like uh i want to say it was like i don't remember the length i'm going to guess 45 minutes it's a very long recording of just how he does his thing and he was by himself in the woods and it was actually pretty interesting back to back to yesterday when you look at how it gets made sometimes it ends up a whole different layer of of interest in the so craft the synergies here are always striking so i did see a video from johnny cash yesterday uh maybe youtube i don't remember It, it it came to me somehow talking about and this is common knowledge for anyone who writes music but he's like i can't say next tuesday at four o'clock i'm gonna sit down and write a song he said but if i say i'm gonna go walk in the woods next tuesday for several hours then odds are strong that i can come out of the woods and have written a song or have a melody for a song and that's that's what i heard jerry seinfeld describe this have you ever watched comedians in cars drinking Drinking coffee? coffee yeah Love that. I love that. Uh, but he was talking, I think, with Chappelle um, and and basically uh, was alluding to the fact that creativity is like having mice in your house. And <laughs> you the ideas you don't you don't develop the ideas like you. The mouse runs out, the idea runs out and you step on its tail and pick it up. So anyway, yeah, I could see that. I mean, I'm 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 creative in the sense that I like to make things. So sure. so if you sit down to go through the effort of producing, and I, when I say make things, I don't mean like I'm a woodworker. I mean all kinds of different things. There was yeah. not a thing. Time was spent. A thing was made. Right. So <laughs> the it's you know and that so so make a thing 
as the creative energy uh, is more about habit than inspiration. In For my sure. Opinion. So if you spend the time on sitting down to make a thing, you, eventually some things that you liked will be made. If you never sit down to make a thing because you're waiting on inspiration, you simply will not get inspired. Like it's, it's just not going to happen. So that, you know, if you want to draw and you dedicate time to drawing, you know, the thing to do is dedicate time to drawing. And if you can't, if you can't think of what to draw, start drawing circles, start drawing lines, start drawing triangles, like d draw the things that are the basic, you know, components of how you would draw something. And now you're in the practice of drawing and you know, you've done it and maybe something comes out of that. Maybe it doesn't. And then the next day you try again. And if you don't do it each day, then you won't have anything to show for it because you didn't start. But if you, if you do it each day, some of those days will be inspired. And I think that flies in the face of whatever, how, like how people want it to work. Because if you're looking at say, the best that Clyde has ever released, Clyde the band, uh, phenomenal band by the phenomenally way. good band. Like yeah. you want to hear the best that Clyde has to offer. You know, I, I mean, it may have been three years of get in the studio and, or or go off to the woods and write, then get in the studio and track things, then spend time on the engineering, and then like then go out and and play the you know play the stuff live so that you get a sense of, of what the song is learn the songs rehearse the songs like get to know the songs not in the sense of i can now physically play the song but like that song becomes a thing that i know like i know how to tie my shoes right and that is a lot of effort that the typical <clears throat> you know aspiring you know rock star musician creative of any kind particularly if they're starting young, man, it's, it's so, it's not, it's not fun to think about that as the process. What's fun is like, we got on stage and we jammed out, right? Like that's what's fun. That's what gives people a thrill and keeps them coming back. But if you didn't have anything to jam out to, or cause you were bad, you know, then you gotta get back and, and hunker down. But what you just explained is all these people that say, when you love what you do, it's not like work at all. Um, it's a slight misnomer, slight misnomer. Yeah. That I don't view that whole process that you just mentioned. I, that to me is cathartic. Yeah. I have to do it. Yeah. I love it. I don't ever have a feeling of I have to, or I, you know, I don't want to, for me to sit down and find 15 minutes to play the guitar or to think about a melody or to write something. That's not something I have to do. That's something that's very satisfying on every level that something can be satisfying. Right. And so I conceptually can understand when people make that comment, uh, what it is that they're referring to. Well, and the, the other thing is that the, you know, getting to the part where it's fun also requires a certain level of mastery. So right. if when you sit down to, to play the guitar, you have not spent the cycles going through how do you make your fingers work correctly, it will be much less satisfying each time you do it because you, you simply are not able to do the thing that you sat down and wanted to do, which was express yourself through the instrument or, you know, play something that sounded good or, you know, catch a vibe, man. Like you can't catch a vibe <laughs> if you don't really know how to, how to play. But I, I loved every minute of that too. So I taught, I, I learned to play. I taught myself to play guitar. I was, I was just, had just finished college. I was probably 20, 21 years old. So you're an old fart by the time I you was started. In, in learning to play an instrument in terms. Now I in played. guitar years, you were dead actually. Yeah, I should be. Now but, in, in bass guitar years, you were still a youth. <laughs> no, because in bass guitar, nobody goes to learn to well, another, <laughs> another discussion. Uh, but no, I, I mean, I'd played other instruments before guitar, but I loved every second of guitar. Wait, what'd I, you play before guitar? Uh, drums. That's what I started on. How um, old were you when you started playing the drums? Probably 13 or 14. Okay. So then, uh, fine. Then you don't count. You weren't an old fart when you started playing guitar because you already played the drums. Uh, yeah, but we're, we're, we're being liberal with the term play here. I mean, did you have a drum kit that you sat down on and banged in time and played with musicians at church? Yeah, so yes. there you go. So, so there you go. Yeah. 
anyway get your kids get your kids started early because otherwise they'll grow up to be immoral because they won't understand the value of hard work so we mentioned we mentioned or i mentioned netflix earlier uh i rarely watch tv we've discussed this but for some reason a week or so ago i had netflix on and netflix thinks that because i haven't seen wolf of wall street that i should watch wolf of wall street and beat me over the head with this suggestion so over the course of about five nights uh i watched wolf of wall street and i'm not gonna lie there is a very small part of me that wants to live that guy's way not the money part (laughs) But the hedonism and just yeah. the disregard for any sense of morality, um, there's a part of me that thinks that looks liberating. I know it's not, but like that is, that was fast. I, I, I admire people and not admire, I admire people that can go through life in that fashion. Do you think is the moral of the story that you should not live that way? Is the moral of the story that you, you know, we could live this way is the moral of the story that with no guardrails, everyone will live this way. Like what's the, what what am I supposed to take? I don't, I know the story vaguely, but I haven't seen the movie. So give me the, I don't care about the rest of the plot or anything, but tell me the moral of Wolf of Wall Street. Hedonism. That's not a moral. A moral is like. It's, it's amoral. It's immoral. Immoral. Yeah, there there are no morals and there are means to ends. There are no real relationships. Um, it's just savagery. It's just consumption. That's all it is. It's just wanton consumption. And the, so the moral here is that this is a, it's a warning that you can have it all and here will be the costs. I, yeah, I, I didn't I didn't necessarily need to consume it that way. I mean, I'm sure that's the message. I don't think that was Scorsese's intent, but like I- I'm begging you to just give me a succinct moral to the Wolf of Wall Street. I didn't even know it was Martin Scorsese. If if you told me it's a Martin Scorsese movie, I would tell you that I can tell you, having not seen yes. anything in the movie except like social media clips of it and the trailer and the name of it and Scorsese, the moral of this story is you can have everything you want, but remember it comes at a cost. That's the moral. Like- and and raw like it you know it's i I liked it it's very raw um i do i will say the twist at least for me uh the twist the scorsese twist in the movie is that there are multiple scenes where leonardo dicaprio's character jordan whatever his name is in the movie is speaking to his company and it's very much uh, a cult. It, Scorsese is trying yeah. to cinem- cinema in, in, in cinematic artistry express that that Wall Street money at all cost, you know, not real bright people, but just, you know, going at it, that it's a cult. It, it very much for me, having grown up in Pentecostal church, it very much had the vibe of a Pentecostal church service. And I think that was intentional. And I loved every second of it. Loved every second of it. I will say. Um, Do you know what's weird? What? The root of the root of the word cult, by the, the Latin root, it means grow. Cultivate. Yeah, cultivate, sure. Yeah. But when we think about culture, it's things that we've cultivated. Cults are bad, arguably. Culture's good. <laughs> it's a fine line, right? The first couple, four couple letters make a big yeah, difference. Yeah, the first four. It's whatever you tack on to the first four uh, that changes your understanding or the meaning. Yeah, but I, I obviously, if if one is concerned about judgments and morality, that's an easy case study. You're going to be hard pressed outside of the folks who live that way which I think is a minority. Uh, do we, do we, do we agree with that? Uh, so there's only, there's three groups. Okay. So uh, this is very broad brush, but the three groups are people who put themselves above everything else for the sake of hedonism, meaning just like immediate pleasure above all everything else, you know, be damned. I'm the only thing that matters. That's, that's the first group. The second group 
wants to do that but feels bad so stops and doesn't do that the third group is not as naturally inclined towards that degree of hedonism they find satisfaction through things like altruism or uh you know good works or you know through others as opposed to through themselves so on the spectrum of individualism versus collectivism the people who are most individual individually focused and on themselves right so they're egotistical and and they are um they're narcissistic so that they're really only worried about themselves and they they just can't see the harm that it does to other people or they see it and they don't care right so antisocial there, there's all these different words that characterize what you are at that end of you know pleasure for me comes first and above everything else then the the far other end that, i think that's a tiny minority of people right I okay think so people that, just don't work that way what do you when you say tiny minority because that's what i'm interested in i don't do know you, like five five to ten percent of the world's population do you think do you think it's a tiny minority uh because there's truly just not that many people or do you think it's a tiny minority because people are don't have the opportunity to live that way i think the biological imperative to keep the species going forward creates a natural inclination to socialize and applies pressure on you know, rabid individualism to that That's degree fair. and rabid self enrichment. So things like, so I also, I, I genuinely don't believe that there's a large number of people who are primarily satisfied through altruism and, you know, good works to others. I think most people are selfish. Most people will, you know, take gains for themselves over gains for others like blah 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 however and that's like that's a huge chunk in the middle so everybody else comes first small minority i come before everybody else you know every and that's the only thing that matters small minority the the overwhelming majority in the middle are greedy and selfish and self-interested and hedonistic to a degree however there are there are social structures and culture that that basically squash those you know base instincts and create things like guilt or actual consequences or uh, you know countervailing pressure to to kind of prevent that from happening or ambition to counter ambition so i i think i think a large number of people would live that way if they could but that's it's so impossible that a large number of people could live that way because <laughs> because we have we have institutions and society and rules and norms and conventions that basically keep everybody from being that greedy so you have to kind of be above and beyond greedy to be able to to cash in on it do you think it um if we think about the changing of cultural norms and mores and 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 that sort of thing do you think that obviously it's cyclical there are probably periods at least in modern history periods where um you know culture is more lax on that hedonistic lifestyle um does it track with the church does it track with uh you know are, are we cyclical with our uh, adherence to relig religion and religious culture and I mean I, I see it as liberalism versus conservatism and I don't mean that in I certainly don't mean that in terms of political parties and I, I don't even necessarily mean it in terms of uh, liberal democracy or liberal economy versus um, something else it literally means conservative tends to favor things that are the same over time liberal tends sure. to you know, or pro progressive could be another way to look at it, but it's, it's, you know, generally seeks out and favors change versus staying the same. So I think access to information encourages liberalness versus conservatism because you have a proliferation of choice. Um, I think that, that wealth, wealth amassing generally leads to a uh, inclination towards liberalism if that ma if that wealth is at least somewhat spread out so if you get rich and everybody else gets poor conservatism will reign you'll be like i want things to stay this way please yeah if you get kind of rich and you see me 
running some risk of getting richer than you, all of a sudden we went from you would have been a staunch keep it the way it is person to a hold on now. Let's let's not let's let's not keep it exactly the same. Maybe maybe that would be bad because you see the prospect of of that rewarding me instead of you. So I, I think there's a bunch of things that that factor into the looseness of institutions. I mean, I feel like where you and I are now is definitely trending towards hedonistic, not, you know, careful, conservative, re- restrained, you know, uh, I, I don't even know what else to, what else to call it other than, you know, high, high moral restraint, right? Like there's, there's a lot of room for, um, you know, debauchery on both the extreme end and on the minor end that, that I don't think has existed in somewhat recent history. Like America is a pretty conservative place. And at the moment, it's not acting particularly keep things the same and let's be stuffy. Yeah. And I think I think there are challenges. I'm not the moral arbiter of all those things, but I think there are challenges when a lot of things downstream are impacted by uh, failed moral cohesion or fail, especially when that impacts the family. Because I think from a policy perspective, whatever policy we're talking about, a lot of things are impacted, I think, negatively by degradation of the family. I think there's no debate that historically and in the future, uh, now, you know, what it constitutes a family and a stable family is up for interpretation, but um, a, a viable, thriving family unit impacts positively a society across the board. And I don't think that can be argued. So I think where I, you know, and I don't have a, I don't have a hedonistic versus uh, conservative or, you know, liberal versus conservative as you defined it position other f- I do for myself, but for people other than I think hedonism, whether you subscribe to that or not, one of the, there are probably multiple, uh, ch- you know, childhood education is another, but I think one of the most important things that should not be impacted by a person's choice to live how they want to live morally should be the family structure. And I, you know, there, that's a, a conversation in and of itself, but I think whatever, whatever we view culturally as important individually over time and however that changes should never be at the expense of the family unit. And I, mean, I think there's, the proof is in the pudding there, right? So you look at all of, all of human history across all cultures and up to a point there's never really been a time when an entire society you know for example was blindly in favor of you know all of its men siring you know dozens of children out of wedlock you know like even the concept of of marriage has been near universal for for human history so the idea that you have you have you have marriage the concept of a family is almost universal across all of humanity so the definition of how that how that plays out can be different and the relative importance of say the nuclear family unit versus your extended family or you know what is allowed to count as a family all that stuff can change over time For sure. the, the basic the basic tenet that you have you know kids are born and raised and their family ties matter and will basically, you know, dictate what the future of their, their, what trajectory their lives are on. And therefore that's important. I mean, that's been almost shockingly stable because if you think about it, that for all the people that have ever lived, it wouldn't be that crazy to have like a totally different family structure show up or, or a, a totally different definition of family. Like why not just have, you know, the men all go to war each year and the women all stay home with kids. Like that's not, I mean, nobody does that as the main, the main unit, even if the men go off to war, you still have like, it's my family at home and I'm fighting to protect my family. Right. And you're, you're fighting for something and for your children and so on and so forth. So, so the, the lack of different variations that fall really far afield or like, 
you know, I have kids and then we do a big kid swap and I don't raise my own kids. Like that's not a thing. Right? Yeah. Like, it's never been a thing. Or uh, yeah, even, even like polyamory and, 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 uh, and polygamy surprisingly not common across history. I mean, at least not in any official capacity. Not to say not to say it hasn't existed, but you know, if that was, you, you'd be hard pressed to say that that is that's like a core way that you know most of society functioned. Seems like in biblical times that was the norm. The stuff that got written down for sure. Yeah, well, that's a good point. We don't know. Yeah, we we have no idea what what it really was. How, how but... long was it from uh, from some of the early books of the Old Testament to? Jesus's birth. You know, I think that would be an interesting thing to discuss uh, or or look into at some point. Is and there are all sorts of writings on the topic, but the historical um, context of the Bible and the books. Have you ever read uh, Common Sense? Uh, no, I haven't. the The Thomas Paine book. No, I've read pieces of it excerpted to Wikipedia. <laughs> he basically is, it's a book about every book of the Bible is historically and factually not as we take it to be. Yeah. Like it goes through every book of the Bible and, and gives examples of why this is a fifth translation of yeah, 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 yeah. an original you know it, it, he he debunks the bible basically does it so is there a debunking of the fact that jesus's mom and dad were sort of a big deal <laughs> yeah I, I i don't remember him like the, ba the basics of christianity yeah not as much as well I, I suppose that the being the being raised from the dead is probably as big a deal as the virgin birth but let, I don't know. Let's say the virgin birth is a big deal. I think that's fair. <laughs> Probably fair. Even with the virgin birth, I mean, we're talking about a mommy and a daddy and a yeah. baby, right? And yeah. like that, that there's no, there's no like daddy and one of his wives. It's a mommy and a daddy and a baby. And if you go like way back, you got like Abraham had multiple wives, but that was a thousand years before Jesus's birth. So there's yeah. a thousand years of room for culture to have changed there. Also geographic, also, you know, all the, there's, there's room for those to be there. And certainly the base unit, mommy, daddy, baby. I don't know. I can ask, I can ask Bard or chat GP, GPT, but I trust <laughs> them to be accurate on this. You know, was that a normal family unit? I trust, I trust AI to be as accurate as I trust 2000 years of interpretation of Bible stories to be right. accurate. <laughs> But you know, this is not what we're talking about. I mean, it kind of is, but it is because we're talking about where does where does the morality of culture even come from? Like, it, what's what reinforcing I'm, it? Yeah. So what I'm getting ready to say, I think whether it's the Christian theology in the Bible or you know the Quran, whatever, choose your choose your religion and choose your text. I think the point that to me is such a trivial point is that people try to validate the necessity of the institution based on the accuracy of the text. It doesn't matter. To me, it doesn't matter. The institution serves a purpose as an institution, yeah. but the text serves a purpose for the individuals. I read the Bible all the time. I do not read the Bible ever. I have no problem saying that. I, I think in uh, a number of ways, it helps me. I've got a good filter. I ignore the stuff that I don't, you know, that has changed culturally over time. Um, but there are things in the Bible that if you take them as they're, as you're supposed to take that text, you live your life a certain way according to wanting to be in line with that text. Now I have other things that I do that with as well. Um, the point of the text, the point of the institution is not a hundred percent veracity. That misses the entire point. Yeah. We need we need things. We need things. We need those institutions. We need those texts. Because otherwise we fill in those voids with things that are destructive to culture and beauty and the things that we're talking about this week. I think the failure um 
And I think the church is, uh, you choose your religion. I think the church's failures in a, in a lot of ways can track, you know, as the, the reason at the institutional failures of church, and we don't have to go through what they are. Everybody can think of their own handful of them, but I think we can track a lot of objective cultural and policy failures that we've been talking about and sort of changes in culture that maybe aren't for the better changes in beauty, those things. The institution of the church is got some responsibility, that, some can I, culpability. Can I throw out a completely ungrounded, uh, and of course, not based in fact thesis? Of course. I, actually, let me call it instead a thought experiment. I like to imagine that across all, all of time, when religion has always been a, a major driver in culture and society in the vast majority of societies. I like to imagine that in all of those times and places, there were people that just weren't, they really didn't like church that much. For sure. And they were like, I, uh, and so if, if you were, if you were a Puritan, right? Like, or, a, or, you know, you'd come to the United States to, or what was, what was not the United States yet to avoid persecution in your homeland. You might have lived in that in that society, but there was there was going to be that one guy who was like, "Man, I just don't want to go to another witch burning." <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's they probably didn't do anything wrong, and I, this this all just it smells it smells fishy to me, you know. And wh what if there aren't even what if there aren't even witches? What if there aren't even witches? Then what? <laughs> and I can't even say this out loud. I say this out loud now. I'm a witch, and yeah. I think that, I think that guy's always been there <clears throat> and or lady. For good reason. And also, uh, uh, you know, the enlightenment is uh, a thing. And if I, I think there's there's no one, you know, I don't think we need uh, a theocratic society. I really don't. I think people should want to do good because they want to do good for good's sake. But it's what we're talking about, morality and culture. And I think people left to their own devices without an institution of some sort. I don't think the, en the enlightenment works conceptually great, but in practice it does not. And, uh, I think, are you, are you trying to ask, do we live in a, <laughs> are you trying to ask, do we live in a moral society? No, I'm trying to say that without guardrails, the, the, and whatever the guardrails are, we need them. Uh, whether it's the Enlightenment and you know Montesquieu and Thomas Paine and all of those writers, and that gives you the you know uh, you know the intellectual guardrails, or whether it's a religious institution, I think there are more wolves of Wall Street than either of us realize, and I think those people have an effect they, they move the Overton window for society and for culture. And there are, I think there are more of those people that are comfortable being that person today in a lot of ways, not just in wall street, you know, debauchery, but in, in a lot have of you, ways, have you read a, a lot about serial killers and sociopaths. No, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so serial killer, serial killers, and sociopaths. The at least the you know the, the science and social science on this up till now generally indicates that someone who is is antisocial or sociopathic, they do not. There, there's a couple degrees. There's that they don't realize that what they, that their actions harm someone else, and there's they don't they they do realize that their actions harm someone else, and they they don't care, but not in the sense that like they're quieting the voice inside. They don't have a voice inside that's saying it's bad. So like if you kick a puppy and the puppy squeals, you or I are like, oh my God, the poor puppy. And if you are a sociopath, you just don't, you, you don't feel the pain or you don't feel anything for the puppy that has been kicked. And that's, that's more of a biological brain chemistry, hardwiring thing than it is a, you know, upbringing thing. So if you, if you lack the ability to empathize like that because of how you're hardwired, you don't necessarily become a killer, right? You're not going to kill just to see what the inside of a person looks like because you don't feel for them. Because there may be things that you want in the world to satisfy 
your self-centered self and you don't see you number one you just may not have a desire to kill anybody number two you you may see that there are all sorts of reasons why it's logistically complex to kill someone number three you might have 10 other ways that it's easier to get what you want than killing somebody right so there, there are all of these other things that 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 make it so that not every sociopath becomes you know a serial killer for example but i think but, go ahead no 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 please jump i was in. gonna say i think we're 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 in the the far right tail on this discussion. The, tip, the tippiest tip of the tail. Yeah, we're in the far right tail of this discussion. I think what this looks like in the the happy middle. Well, hold uh, on, because I think incrementally you go from sociopath, crazed killer, enjoys lying, only cares about themselves, uh, in physically physiologically incapable of empathy. You know, this is evil incarnate. You know. But also a lot of these people, the the people that know them are like this very, very likable guy. He's just, you know, he was great to spend time with. I mean, <laughs> he was he was a killer, but he was great to spend time yeah. with. Who would have guessed? Who you know, I you you know, yeah, he did a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> um and this is like somebody who who's a who's a, a you know, multiple serial killer rapist, like dismembering bodies and blah, 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 blah. And like all the prison guards love him. Uh so that's that the extreme tale, but then work your way back from that where the actions really wouldn't the actions of a person who is also a sociopath, meaning they don't feel empathy for others, but their actions don't lead to, you know, a murder spree. It leads to things like serial divorcee or, uh, you know, buys and crashes a large boat or a fast car or something like that. And all these other behaviors that seem like their personality but in reality, all of them stem from the fact that this person does not care about how other people are feeling. And that's further down from the tip because there are more people that don't become psychotic serial killers than there are uh, and who still don't feel empathy the same way as the fat middle. And then you get further down to the people that feel bad about what they're doing and still do bad stuff. And that's like the by far a bigger chunk than the people who just don't feel bad. Yeah, I think I think. There's a less benign version of even the serial divorcee and the, um, you know, the the boat crasher or the car the, crasher, the, the perpetually destructive or socially destructive personality, the person who, with children at home and a family, um, chooses to go, you know, be with the boys or the girls and drink and, uh, you know, that quiet. Uh, despair sort of lifestyle, like no real investment in things that matter except my personal satisfaction. And I know yeah. a lot, I know a lot of people like that. I know a lot of people with high functioning careers and, um, you know, uh, uh, in fact, I think that's the overwhelming majority of people. And my fear is, is the reason why this topic of culture and evolution is I think that is, the norm now i feel like like it's a rarity for me to have um people that i respect that that consistently make choices that are like i don't i don't i don't feel like and maybe it's the circle we're in or or i don't know but i don't feel like i don't feel like that we i think culture has devolved to the point where the 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 overton window has shifted there is no societal pressure to sacrifice personal desire for the betterment of even your intimate family or the intimates close to you. And I think that's more what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, we're always going to have the outliers. We're always going to have the far tail that are the extreme versions of this. But I think culture, I feel like, or my concern is, I don't know, we ha we're we not talking hard numbers here. If anyone can even talk hard numbers, but my concern is, is that the Overton window of culture has shifted and it's now okay. We're even rationalizing um, and, and retail therapy is giving people the excuse to satisfy their own individual desires. I feel like it a lot of times for at the expense of intimates and those closer to them. I think, I think there's a, you may be right, but I also think there's another another explanation here. And the, the other explanation is that you are you're following a well trod path of becoming a grumpy old man. 
It is, uh, but I'm not grumpy. You were shaking your fist at the, at the kids on the lawn. I mean, think think about it this way: take two steps back and be be a be be a 22 year old picking up a guitar after a decade of drumming, and think about think about the people that you thought were old then. And you don't have to, you don't like, just picture them in your mind, right? Picture somebody you thought was old. I got a guy. He was a Cub Scout, uh, like an assistant scout master, but he didn't have any kids in the troop. His kids were adults. He was there because he liked to camp and whittle wood and hang out. And he, uh, <laughs> and, he, and he would pee in a Ziploc bag overnight with a sponge in it so he didn't have to get out of his tent. I, honestly, looking back, I seriously doubt this guy was like much more than his mid 50s. <laughs> Maybe his mid sixties, but I don't think he was. I don't think he was objectively all that old. And I was looking at this. This is my example of a guy who was old. Now, this particular guy, when I'm picturing old guy, I'm not picturing shaking a stick at kids on his lawn, and I'm also not picturing any claims to how society has gone downhill or the the decline of American mortality. Mor- sorry, morality, American morality. But now, imagine th- take the old guy you have in your mind. Now imagine him putting down a paper and just being disgusted by something he's read as he haphazardly comments out loud about the decline of morality in America today. (laughs) I think, yeah, so I think there's, uh, there's observation without value judgment. And I think earlier in the week, or maybe it was last week, we talked about one in 10, you know, the, the markers are there that people yeah, but kids are, today is a trope because kids today is a thing that people repeat, you know? No. I, and I don't think, uh, I don't think that, um, I, I don't think, in fact, it may be better. I don't know. You know, I think of the fifties, um, you know, the 1950s sort of caricature of the, you know, the dad that, goes to work and comes home drunk right, and right, right. beats everybody inside. I'm not saying that it's better or worse today. I'm saying we're normalizing that. I feel like, I feel like it, I've, maybe I am saying it's worse. I think, I, and again, I feel, or if it's the same, you know, who knows? We, we don't have a comparison. We can't say what the metric was at some point in time and what it is today in terms of more people are selfish today. Right. Right. If you, if you could ever say that, um, I just know, I know a, a lot of instances where, uh, and probably more, th- it feels like, <laughs> So this, this has <laughs> to be, <laughs> this has to mean it, whatever the ratio is, we should want it to be less. We should want, we should want people to consider harmful behaviors less individually if it is harmful to the collective good or to their intimate circle, especially. See, now you got me back in. Right. So when it's when it's a comparison against a an ill-defined other time or place or group, I'm like, get off my lawn. Yeah. But when but when it is when the when the when the the rhetorical case is shifted to, isn't it always better to strive for less harm? Now I'm like, yes, it is always better to strive for less badness and less harm. So let, let's let's focus. I, while you were talking, I hope you're not offended that I uh, that I went to Bard to ask a question. <laughs> Here's what I got. I said, Bard, how long have been people? How long have people been complaining about the decline of moral society? Oh Lord! <laughs> Here we get Larry Larry. What's his name? Larry Page's <laughs> version of this answer. Uh, I'm only going to read the first sentence, but this appears to be like 40 paragraphs long. Uh, people have been complaining about the decline of moral society for at least 2,000 years. <laughs> and my favorite part about this is I, who looked that question up using Bard, I remember a time, I remember a time when I didn't have to question the authority of the source I went to for answers like this. <laughs> I would just go to a library and I'd ask a librarian and they'd help me look up the card catalog, which would help me find the philosopher Livy, whose, whose words I would then read 
in a text that had been passed down through the generations of libraries. And now I have to wonder, <clears throat> is that even true? Or does it just sound good to say that Livy's been doing this? Because I have no reason to trust. And now I have to go do the same work I had to do before. But instead, I'm going to shoot my mouth off about how people have been claim complaining for 2000 years, even though we already know that the AI is not programmed to be accurate. Yeah. It's a real problem. I, well, you've shamed me into... <laughs> You've shamed me into um, probably what clarifying and and the position is. Yes, it's not a. It, you can't make those comparisons anyway, and that's not what I'm yeah. trying to do. Right. Um, you just can't. You can't. These these subjective discussions of morality and culture. What you can compare are in recorded. Anyway, you can never compare because you don't know what the starting metric is. You can't define a measurable starting metric other than, you know, anecdotally. But what you can say is it it should be more of a focus to um, we should all want to uh, be tempered in our individualism and satisfying those hedonistic desires culturally and aware of where we are at culturally today for the collective good in that respect. Just think, that of, think of me as your, <laughs> as your shiny, polished, curved piece of glass. I'm here to, I'm here to focus your hot rage. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no hot rage, but you, you did shame me out of uh, <laughs> trying to make a comparison, which I don't think I was trying to do other than an observation. You know, but, you, you know the only way to avoid becoming the grumpy old man on the porch is to keep that grumpy old man close at hand at all times. Yeah. And, I don't, uh, and don't, don't pee in a plastic bag, even if it's got a sponge in it, just, just get up, just get up and go pee. It'll be that's, okay. That's the weirdest thing. That's like the, uh, the astronaut, um, the female astronaut from several years back who drove in a I diaper drove with the diaper. It's in order to go avenge their, their love feud. And the diaper made it so they have to stop less. Yeah. 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 Oof. Have you ever been that rattled in any way? Like not that you've acted on it, but that you've, the, 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 the conditions were right for, you know, diapers to be worn, you know, blinded with rage or envy or jealousy. Yeah, I mean, I get, I, I, I am, ex I'm prone to extreme agitation. Sure, I don't know that it would go that far, but uh, yeah, I, I, I could, I don't know. I, I feel like we're all just one, one set of circumstances and and one bad night's sleep away from driving somewhere to avenge a love feud in a diaper and getting busted for it. But then again, I, then I think maybe that's just me. I I wouldn't do that. I would I would defend my children aggressively uh, I, or or different. my family. I don't, think, but. I don't think I would do it. But also, I mean, nobody ever thinks they would do the crazy stuff that they do. That they do. Fair. Circumstances are weird. Yeah, I mean, I, I I've got some some bizarre behaviors, goofy behaviors. Um, you know, in my, in my younger years, just, you know, like out of ignorance, nothing criminal, um, but just goofy behaviors that I think, you know, you ever get moments, you ever have a moment in the shower or driving where you're like, you have a flashback to something that you've done. Um, and again, not criminal or not bad, but you're like, oh, it's it's just like it's brutal to think that that it's was cringy. me. It's yeah, cringy. that was me at one time. Yeah, I think that's that's what separates you from the sociopaths. Yeah. So congratulations, you're not a grumpy old man. You're not a sociopath. Talk to you tomorrow. Self awareness. <laughs> you, you did it. Superpower. See you tomorrow on Terry's superpowers. All right, man. Have a good one. Bye. <laughs>